Hey, good afternoon. I wanted to take an opportunity to thank you for joining me today. Um, the next three Sundays, I have a series of messages that I'm going to share with you. I'm taking, taking the rest of this month off, so I've made these videos uh, ahead of time, and I'm just going to share these messages uh, with you and and hopefully you'll tune in and and be able to g glean something from these words um, you know we still have so much going on in the world today so much happening with uh, with re uh, things relating to the coronavirus I know that in our church this past week we we had the deep clean and sanitize and disinfectant but uh, there's a lot of other issues at work um, within our government, within uh, the denomination. Uh, I'll be sharing those things with you uh, as uh, time allows, as, as we need to, to, to be aware of those issues. Things are changing, and I think we need to be aware of that, and I think we need to be prepared for that. God will still do a great work, but we just have to trust him to know that it may look a little different. In fact, it may look exactly like Jesus intended it to look when the early church was first formed. So, you know, we're, we're here just to, you know, just to praise God and to learn about his word and to use those principles and apply them in our lives. And that's what I want you to do today. I just want you to understand that God is with you and he's, he's watching over you right this very moment. You know, I'm just going to pray right now. Dear God, I, I just speak your power over everyone is, that is watching. Lord, I speak your a spirit of love, calm, peacefulness. Lord, give them hope. God, you're going to carry us through this, this entire event. And we're going to be stronger in our relationship with you. I pray for those that may be sick, those that may be suffering. And I just, I just speak your healing and miraculous touch into their lives. And we just believe that and know that you are, you are a God that, that, that keeps true to his word. And we just declare it right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. This morning... I want to start a, a, a series of three messages that's, that's, that's entitled Delivered from the Lion. Now today, uh, this one is Delivered from the Lion, the Strongholds of the Lion. And, I, I, uh, and I'm, I'm doing, you can, you can see I'm doing all of my, all of my own uh, recording and everything uh, I'm thankful I'm thankful for the technology that we have that we are are able to to film and and do the audio and and put all of these things in so I would just ask that you grab a Bible with me uh, and we're gonna we're gonna start right in and talk about uh, talk about spiritual war, warfare and I'm going to teach you some principles about your unseen enemy. You know, a lot of people don't realize that they even have an enemy. There's a story of a boxer told that was, he, he, he was badly losing in a fight. And he went to the corner, his eyes were, were ne nearly swollen shut, and his face was all puffed up. And his trainer said to him, hey, kid, get in back in there. You know, he hasn't laid a glove on you yet. And the boxer looked up at him and said, well, would you please keep your eye on the referee then? Because he's beaten me senseless. And he didn't know where the punches were even coming from. You know, spiritual warfare is a lot, is a lot like that. There's an unseen world where you're going through all of these spiritual battles. Today, I'm going to show you the strategies 
of the devil. Now, the devil really only has three strategies. He's got strongholds, he's got arguments, and then he has curses. So, those three things are the primary ways in which he operates. But you need to understand that the devil is already defeated. He was defeated at the cross. He was defeated at the resurrection. So the devil is already a defeated foe. So we're going to look in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17. And read that with me. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Now, Bible scholars look at this verse and they say, what in the world is Paul talking about? I mean, was, was he over in the amphitheater, amphitheater? You know, was he getting ready to, to face a, a, a physical lion? Most Bible theologians believe that Paul was talking about a spiritual lion. You know, that same lion that's mentioned over in 1 Peter 5, 8, the devil goes about as a roaring lion, lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, I'm told that a, that a roaring lion is an old lion, a lion that has already used up most of his strength. And all he can do is roar loudly in hopes to intimidate his prey into paralysis so that he can catch up to them. Now this really tells us that the enemy already knows that he's defeated. So all he needs to do to operate in your life, in my life, is a little ignorance of his devices. And in that ignorance, he can roar through the media, through a job, through a medical report, through a bank statement, anything that will freeze you in your tracks. Now, you have to realize that the devil doesn't like you, and he doesn't like me a whole lot. A lot of, you know, a, a lot of people say, well, well I don't want to, uh, I don't want to mess with the devil because I might make him mad at me. Man, here's what you got to understand. The devil already is mad at you. And he's already doing everything he can to destroy you. John 10 says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But there's no reason to, to, to fear because he's already defeated. The only thing that gives the devil access into your life is through three things. Strongholds, curses, and arguments. Now, I read about a couple that were staying in the bush country of Africa, and they were told to keep the fire burning in their camp because the, the, the lions are afraid of the fire. And they allowed the fire to go out in their camp. And in fact, a lion did come in and killed one of them. So this is my first obvious point. The devil does not come around a believer who is full of the fire of God. Okay? You want to be full of the fire of God. Now, I'm talking about real Holy Ghost fire. We should be saying, Lord, make me so hot that if the devil touches me, he's going to get a blister. So you need the fire of God in your life. If you're one of those cooled down Christians, then you're, you're, you really are fair game to the devil. You need to be white hot for God. The second thing I learned about lions is that when they hunt zebra, they're get, they, they usually follow that herd. That herd 
is composed of, of hundreds or even thousands of zebras. Now, the lion won't go in front of that herd because they're afraid that they may get stampeded to death. So they follow from behind. They look for the stragglers. They look for the one zebra that's been uh, separated from the herd. Maybe he gets distracted or, or injured. And then that's how the lion is able to come between that zebra and the rest of the herd. Now, one of the, big, one of the devil's biggest strategies is to get you separated from the fellowship of other Christians to the point that you think, I'm, on, I'm in this all by myself. I'm on my own. I don't need to listen to them. I believe that Christians ought to build relationship, relationships with one, with one another so that they can get to the point where you can open up and become transparent with one another, become accountable to one another. In fact, James points that, points that out. He wants us to be able to confess our faults to one another. The problem with modern day Christianity is if I go confess a fault to you, what happens a lot of times is people get on the phone and they say, oh, you never believe what I heard about old, old brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. Man, that, that, that's, that's not being transparent. That's not, that's not uh, helping your brother or sister in Christ. You know, we are supposed to be we are supposed to be people of God that lift one another up, not tear one another down. So we need to build relationships so that we, when we come to that point where we need one another, we're there for one another. The devil's, devil's strategy is to pick us off one at a time. You know, I watched a video once about some water buffalo and they have these gray big horns, and they can, uh, they, 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 can, they can gore a lion to death. But the lions zero in on the young, so the buffalo, what they'll do is they'll protect the young by forming a circle around them. And they have their horns facing out in this protective stance. And the lions just kind of run around the circle, but they can't penetrate it because of the unity of the moms and dads that's all around the babies. But what researchers have found and discovered is that if you know those moms and dads begin to get agitated with one another and then they begin to bump into each other and turn on one another, fight among themselves, it provides an opening for one of those lions to run in, grab, grab one of the young and pull it out. See, you, you need to preach this with me. When we begin fighting one another, the only one that wins is the devil. A house divided against itself cannot stand. If you're a husband and a wife and you're constantly fighting, the devil says, thank you very much. You're providing an entrance for me into your family. And see, that, that's what I want to talk to you about today. Keep your fire burning. Stay connected to your brothers and sisters in Christ and keep your attitudes right toward one another. Now, the first word that I want to give you is, is strongholds. Now, strongholds a, a Satan operates in the realm of um, of the mind. And a stronghold is a reinforced negative thought. So if I allow my mind to think on any little thing that blows through, then that thing is going to burrow its roots down into my mind and bear fruit. And I guarantee you it's not going to be good fruit. The devil is a master at planting thoughts into your mind. Have you ever had the devil tell you that somebody doesn't like you? Well, Pastor Curtis, 
when you're preaching, I can just tell by the way that you're looking at me that you don't like me. What are you talking about? You see that? You see how the devil comes to me and says, well, ah, well, you're not being very supportive of our ministry. And then the devil goes to you and says, oh, the pastor doesn't care anything about you. And the next thing we know is that thought has taken root in our mind and it has grown into a high thought. And we have meditated on it and that high thought has now become a stronghold to us. It's a reinforced negative thought. Fear is a stronghold. Fear of water, fear of flying, fear of spiders, fear of heights, fear of a virus. I mean, if fear becomes a stronghold in your life, it will absolutely immobilize you. How about pride? The devil was kicked out of heaven because of pride because of arrogance, because of a, a superiority complex, a, because of a competitiveness that he was better than God. In your mind, it's like you have to constantly prove that you're better than others. That's a stronghold in your life. Another stronghold is, is hatred. Now in the scripture, Cain became jealous of Abel when the Lord accepted Abel's offering, but he rejected Cain's. And so Cain plotted a, uh, a revenge against his brother, and he rose up in the field, and he killed him. Can you imagine that the very first family had a son that murdered his own brother? I mean, that tells us that if we allow bitterness to, uh, to, to, to put its roots down as a thought in my mind, it can turn into revenge. It could turn into something even criminal. The, the next stronghold is doubt. You know, the devil sows thoughts that God isn't real. Everything, and, and, and the scientific world tries to tell us this, Everything came out of protoplasm in some primordial ancient swamp. Or the devil says, the Bible's not real. Healing's not real. Miracles aren't real. Jesus isn't really coming back again. And all of those thoughts can become strongholds in our minds that need to be cast down. Religion can be can put thoughts in your mind as well. See, the devil, the devil's very religious. Have you figured that out by now? He's very religious. He doesn't want you to feel forgiven. He doesn't want you to feel like you're right with God, but he wants you to con continually feel like you've never done enough. Well, you haven't prayed enough. You haven't read the Bible enough. You haven't given enough. You haven't gone to church enough. And then religion becomes the driving force in your life instead of God's grace giving you a sense that you are right with God. How about a spirit of poverty? I know people that have a stronghold in their mind that they're always going to fail financially. Well, it's just a matter of time before my business goes under it's just a matter of time before I lose my job. You know, they're so, they're so negative in their mind because in their mind, poverty is what they came out of and poverty is where they're going to end up. And greed, greed is the opposite of poverty. You got, you got some people that, that money and possessions consume their minds. We all have to make money to live, but we don't live to make money. Jesus said your life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions. But when money is constantly on your mind, greed has become a stronghold to you. And you know, here's a funny thing. Some of the greediest people that I know don't have very much money at all. How about witchcraft? Witchcraft's another stronghold. And you say, well, you know, hey, 
I mean, I, I've been a Christian for years. I don't have to worry about witchcraft. You know, we think about those, you know, some lady in a, in a tall pointed black hat, you know, stirring her potion. But you know what witchcraft really is? Witchcraft, witchcraft is nothing more than manipulation, trying to manipulate people through your words or even through your prayers, through your actions, just so you can get them to do what you want. And the last one is something that, I, that I've dealt with a lot myself. You know, I've dealt with depression. You know, people, you know, look at this time that we're living in right now. You know, we, we exist in, in, in a world today that is, fine, that, are, that is desperately trying to find a sense uh, or excuse me, that is desperately trying to fight a sense of hopelessness. You know, you can, you can have all the money in the world and still feel hopeless and despair. You can look at the economy and you can say, man, what is happening? This virus has, has ruined our economy. Nothing will ever be the same again. You know, guess what? Greater is he that is in me. Greater is he that's, that's in you than he that is in this world. You got to understand that these, these feelings of anxiety and feelings of depression that we have, they do not belong upon a Christian. And I got to point to myself. Isaiah called it a spirit of heaviness. And that heaviness can become a stronghold in our mind. And it tells us that, you know what? Life just isn't worth living anymore. You know, Jesus told Peter, he said, Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're not thinking the thoughts of God, but the thoughts of men. And here's the other thing I want to give you about how the devil operates. First, you got the strongholds of the mind. And then second, you got these things called curses. Now, curses have to do with the area of words. There's a verse, and I like the Good News translation for this, out of Proverbs 26.2, and it says this, Curses cannot hurt you unless you deserve them. They are like birds that fly by and never settle. What does that mean? A curse cannot come upon a believer, a child of God, unless they've opened up the door and they've allowed that thing to come into their life. You know, I read in the book of Numbers where, where a warlock tried to curse the people of God. And he told the king that had hired him, he said, what God has blessed, I cannot curse. And he, and, and he is blessed and I can't, I can't reverse it. Listen, when we're when we're operating under the blessings of God, no curse can even land on us. You know, I got my fire burning and the power of God is inside of me. And so the devil cannot come along and curse what God has already blessed. That verse in Proverbs says that curses cannot hurt me unless I deserve them. So if I've stepped out of the realm of God's blessing, if I step out from underneath the realm of the blessing of God, then curses can light upon my life. And if that happens, I've got to ask myself three questions. Number one, is there a generational curse or a stronghold maybe that got passed down to me uh, from, through my family? Exodus 20 verse 5 says that the iniquity of the, of the fathers is upon the children to the third and fourth generation. Now, here's something I learned. When I got saved, I started a new generation. I became part of a chosen generation. But at the same time, you might say, well, but everybody in my family uh, gets a divorce. Everybody in my family dies of cancer. Everybody in my family's poor. Everybody in my, my, my family dies of heart attacks. All of my family 
uh, has a problem with, with drug addiction and alcoholism, I'm sure it's going to happen to me too. Wait a minute. You need to change the word that's coming out of your mouth. Proverbs says that life and death are in the tongue. And Satan builds his kingdom on the words that come out of our mouth. In the book of Numbers, it says, as you have spoken out of your mouth, I will do. And I've learned that Christians are not careful with the flow of words coming out of their mouth. And I tell you what, you, if, you, if, if, you, if you sit around talking all the time about, oh man, I tell you what, I'm never going to be successful. I'm always going to be I'm always going to be suffering. I'm always going to be, uh, be poor. I'm going to tell you, that's going to come upon you. That's exactly what will happen. It will become a curse to your life. The next thing is a broken vow. Now, if my mouth declares a vow or a covenant and I give you my word and then I later retract my word or covenant, I need to understand that a covenant brings a blessing or a curse. So a broken vow or a broken covenant is going to bring a curse. If you have broken, uh, if you have broken a covenant, if a nation breaks a treaty with another nation, it always brings a curse. We see in scripture when Gideon was in a treaty with, uh, or excuse me, when Gibeon was in a treaty with Joshua and hundreds of years later, Saul went out and he killed a bunch of Gibeonites. And the Lord told him that because of that broken covenant that he was going to withhold the rain. And so it didn't rain for years until David made amends and broke that curse off of the nation of Israel. The third thing that I've learned that the devil operates in is a spoken word over your life. Now, we live in, a, in, a, in, a, in an age, a time, uh, where you've got people in the, the Christian community that are doing a lot of what I'd call personal prophecy. People may come up to you that you don't even know, hardly even know, don't have really a relationship with, you know, and they may say, well, I had a dream and it was about you and here it, went, here it is. And they, they start, start speaking these words over your life, you know, and they, and they act like they're trying to, to prophesy over you. Thus saith the Lord, you're going to have a hard time and a hard year and some horrible things are going to happen to you. And you need to say, you need to stop it in its tracks and say, hold it right there. I don't receive that word in the name of Jesus. In fact, I cancel that curse that you're trying to put upon me. Now understand, understand that the devil operates through a spoken word. I have known people personally that have received a word and accepted a word that was not from the Lord and that very thing came to pass in their life. So don't you dare receive a curse that is spoken over, over you by some uh, well-intended Christian. I don't care if they do try to say it's from the Lord. It's a lie. Maybe your parents told you that you would never amount to anything. Maybe your boss has told you, you know, you're just absolutely worthless. Anytime anybody says anything like that to you, you need to say, devil, you're a liar. Our minds need to be programmed that whenever we hear any kind of spoken rejection or curse, that we say, devil, you are a liar. You got to understand, my friends, the power of curses. You need to cancel those things over your life. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 3, uh, verse 13, that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. 
Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Can you, can you take a minute and just thank Jesus that you're now under the blessing of God? Oh, thank you, Jesus. I'm not under a curse anymore. I don't live under a curse. My generational curses are broken off of my life. It doesn't matter what my mommy or my dad did. It doesn't matter what my grandma or my grandpa did. Every curse spoken against me cannot land upon me. Now, the last stronghold the devil has is arguments. A legal right that you are giving the devil to come into your life. Ephesians 4 verse 27 says, not to give place to the devil in your life. Don't even give place to to him. And the context of that passage is relationships. Now what I've learned is that I may be given access to the devil as a prosecuting attorney. And he's like this prosecutor that is trying to convict me of a crime. I'm going to look over in, in Revelation chapter 12. And read verse 10. Put it on the screen here for you. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Now that verse right there tells us that the devil is in the business of trying to accuse God's people. Now you remember the story of Job. And it says that Satan went and stood before God. And he told God, he says, does Job fear you for nothing? And God said, no. He's a man of integrity. And the devil said, nah, he's not. If you touch him on his skin with some disease, he's going to curse you to your face. See, that's what the devil does. He's in this ongoing conversation with God about you and me. And here's what he does. See, he, he, sees, he sees a place of, of compromise in our life, and he brings this before God. Hey, I messed up. God, look at your servant. Look at what he's doing. He messed up. Look what he's look 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 look, look what he's trying to do in secret. Now, none of us are perfect, but we need to be operating under the blood of Jesus. And we need to be honest about our mistakes. We need to be open with God. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The book of Proverbs says that he who covers his sin will not prosper. Now, an argument would be like a, 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 a sin that is ongoing in your life that you're trying to hide. An argument could also be rebellion in our lives that's out of God's divine order for us. You see, God has a divine order in this world. Husbands to wives, children's, children to parents, uh, sheep to a shepherd, finances, time. All of those things have an order. And the devil knows when I get things out of order. Stronghold, curses, arguments. That's all the devil's got. He may be roaring. You may be hearing him right now. But that's all, all that he has is what you're giving him. I know people say, well, you just need to rebuke the devil. Well, you can rebuke until you're red in the face. If you don't change the thoughts that are in your mind, the words that come out of your mouth, the convictions of your conscience, the devil will run all over you. So don't allow him any opportunity 
to ruin your life. Now, I'm going to give you three quick steps here as we close out this message on how to break any stronghold, any curse, any argument in your life. Number one, very simple, repent. Repentance means more than just saying I'm sorry. See, true repentance realizes that I've hurt you, that I have hurt God, and I am deeply sorry for it. Real repentance is turning away from an error that you've made without laying the blame at somebody else's feet. Second thing is renounce. 2 Corinthians 4.2 says, We have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Renouncing means telling the devil that I cancel the bitterness in my heart. You know, I release that person who hurt me. I renounce the word that, that maybe I spoke over my spouse or my children in a fit of anger. I renounce it and I, I render it void. And the third thing is a word called recompense. If I steal your car and it's sitting in my garage and I get saved, I don't go back home and say, thank you, Lord, I got saved and I'm forgiven of, of, of stealing this car, but I got a new car and I'm saved. No, 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 no. You have to say, I'm giving the car back. Zacchaeus said, Lord, if I've stolen anything, then I'll restore it fourfold. You see, the Lord's going to bring some people to your mind. Maybe there's some people that you need to forgive. Maybe there's some money that needs to be repaid. Maybe there's some property that needs to be given back. See, what we're doing is giving the devil no place in our life. Deliverance is 99% repentance. And I like what Revelation 12, verse 11 says, the accuser has been cast down and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. When the death angel came through Egypt, he passed over every household where the blood had been applied to the doorposts. The only thing that stops the devil is the blood. The only thing that stops the devil is the blood. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. What's the secret of spiritual warfare? It's the blood. If you put every thought under the blood, if you put every word under the blood, every action under the blood, if you take every argument away from the devil and put it under the blood he has no right no access no authority in your life real spiritual warfare is finding out where your open doors are and then closing them god's already done everything he can my friends the reality is this i've got to apply the blood over my life I know the devil is a roaring lion. He's roaring right now in this world. I know that he's looking for your fire to go out. He's looking for you to become a straggler so that he can come in and pick you off. But if you stay under the blood of Jesus, then you're going to remain safe. Let me pray with you this morning. Dear God, I just ask that, that again, you would let this word just just flood our hearts that if there's anything any door that we have open in our lives that allows the devil access i pray lord god that we apply the blood and shut that door and keep the devil out lord i'm believing for miracles i'm believing for curses to be broken i'm believing for blessings to be manifest and the favor of God to come upon your children. And Lord, I declare that right now 
in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Thank you so much, Lord, for what's already been done and accomplished for us. We ask this in your blessed, holy name. You know, I just want to thank you. I know this whole thing that we've been doing with uh, the virtual church has been different for us. But I do know that God has a plan. I think of all the things, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that God has uh, surrounded me with people that, that are hungry for His Word. And you know, I, I don't have all the answers, but God has been gracious to me and He's allowed me to, to see some things in depth and to have some wisdom. Uh, and I'm trying to impart that to you and share that with you. And sometimes I look at I look at what we're going through, and I look at my life, and I'm saying, "Oh Lord, there's so much that I would like to like to share. There's so much that I would like to do. There's so many things." And and sometimes I just look look at the situation. I'm trying to think, God, what is it that you know? How how are we going to accomplish these things? And I know that God is working. I think some of you are going to be surprised because I think God's going to open some doors that we didn't expect. Uh, so we're going to see some different things happening. I think we're going to see the church operating as it was originally intended to operate. Um, so I believe that. Now, I, like I said, I have so much I would love to share with you, uh, would love to have an interaction with. You know, these things that are happening right now, we say, hey, is this the end? You know? I have a lot of word to share about, I guess, what we would call end times and what we have traditionally believed for so long. I think it's eye-opening. And so I'm just going to ask you right now just to keep the faith and keep going forward. And I just declare God's blessing upon you. And we will see you again. So have a blessed day and a wonderful day in Christ Jesus. Amen, amen, amen.